respectable audience. Okay, sounds good. Uh, well, good morning, and uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I realize it's a uh, first day back after a holiday weekend and bright and early, so thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for Dr. Dr. Altman for having me. Uh, my name is Matt Drake. I'm uh, an assistant professor at OHSU, uh, just south of you in Portland. And uh, most of my time I spend uh, split between the clinical environment working in the medical ICU and then I run a, a, a basic science laboratory looking at uh, mechanisms of asthma. And in particular, looking at the interactions between eosinophils and asthma and airway nerves. So we're gonna talk a little bit about neuroimmune interactions in eosinophilic asthma today. If I can get my screen to go, there we go. I first should make one note. I uh, do some consulting for GSK. They're a maker of mepolizumab, uh, one of the drugs used to treat uh, severe asthma. We'll touch uh, on biologics today, but really focus the majority of the talk on work we're doing in the lab. So what will we be covering today? First and foremost, let's talk about the state of biologics for severe asthma. Where are they working and where are their unmet needs? After talking about that, we're gonna pivot and, and discuss how nerves control bronchoconstriction, and in particular, how eosinophils affect the way nerves control the airways in asthma and the consequences of those effects. And then finally, we're gonna talk about some of our newest work looking at the role of eosinophils in lung development, in particular, how eosinophils during lung development may affect uh, transgenerational inheritance of asthma. Eosinophils, of course, are nothing new in asthma. This is uh, a study from 1958 by Dr. Morrow Brown, who noted that the uh, presence of eosinophils in the sputum predicted a favorable treatment response to prednisolone. This, of course, launched uh, 60 years of asthma therapies where the mainstays have been inhaled corticosteroids or systemic uh, oral corticosteroids, uh, with the goal of really reducing airway eosinophils and the effects that they have in the airways. Now we've learned quite a lot about eosinophils uh, since that time. This is uh, uh, um, showing the relationship between blood eosinophils and the risk of having a severe exacerbation. And you can see here blood eosinophils when used as a surrogate for, for airway eosinophils uh, uh, predict increased exacerbations as, as you uh, increase the level of eosinophilia in peripheral blood. So there's clearly this correlation between eosinophils in the blood and eosinophils in the lung, although it's not perfect. It also does uh, suggest and indicate that there's this uh, relationship between the activity of eosinophils and uh, uh, bad effects in asthma. This eosinophil work, Dr. Morrow Brown and others, uh, really opened up uh, uh, some of the earliest work trying to develop the concept of asthma phenotypes. And by that, I mean these clinically observable traits that uh, patients have, we can cluster them uh, under these phenotypes to try and define uh, patients or groups of patients that have common underlying mechanisms uh, that tie their syndrome together. And so the, the, the connection between asthma endotypes or the common mechanistic pathways and asthma phenotypes has really been something in the last 25 years that, that has led to a, a kind of a new look at asthma, not treating asthma just as, as uh, come one, come all, but, but trying to identify uh, specific mechanisms that are targetable from a treatment standpoint. As part of that, we've developed these biomarkers. Uh, I mentioned blood eosinophils or sputum eosinophils are another means for differentiating asthma phenotypes. Pheno, uh, of course, is another one. And then finally, serum periostin. It, clinically, uh, I would assume uh, most of you are using blood eosinophils and pheno as the primary means because they're easiest to obtain. Uh, but certain centers are, are certainly checking sputum eosinophils as well to help define asthma phenotypes. These phenotypes roughly break down into two major headings, one of which is type 2 high asthma and the other is type 2 low asthma. Within this type 2 high, we have allergic asthma, we have eosinophilic asthma, you also have things like exercise-induced asthma and NSAID uh, exacerbated or aspirin exacerbated asthma. This type 2 high uh, a phenotype in general has some, some common underlying mechanisms that link them together. And on the flip side, you've got type 2 low asthma, which is really most notable for the fact that it lacks features uh, of type 2 high asthma. So it lacks eosinophilia. It lacks having a high pheno. We know obviously a lot less about type 2 low asthma, uh, the, the, the underlying mechanisms, and that's really reflected in the lack of, of effective therapies for folks who, who do not meet criteria for type 2 high asthma. Now, uh, 
in terms of the mechanisms that underlie type two high asthma, we've we've developed a, a, a quite a, a an understanding of the role of eosinophils in this set system. And you can see there's it's you know while the eosinophils are at the center of this slide, it's quite a complex interaction in the airways themselves between ILC two cells, T cells, dendritic cells, B cells. We've been searching for the mechanisms to drive this. And of course, interleukin-5 is an very important one for eosinophils. It's an eosinophil uh, survival factor and eosinophil maturation factor. But that's not the only one that's involved in these processes. We've got interleukin-4, interleukin-13. And then the higher up in, the, uh, in these pathways as well, these alarmins that are released by airway epithelium, things like IL-33, IL-25, and TSLP. All these pathways have recently either been uh, uh, the, the focus of a, develop, a therapeutic development or are in the very near future likely to have uh, commercially available uh, uh, reagents to help target these pathways. And they've been very effective at treating type 2 high asthma. When you look at the approved biologics for type 2 high asthma, most of you, uh, if you work in the clinical environment, are familiar with omalizumab. This was uh, developed quite a long uh, time before uh, the, the recent uh, introduction of, the, uh, of some of the newer therapies. In 2005, omalizumab hit the market. It was targeting uh, IgE specifically. And then in 2015, we had development of mepolizumab, followed by reslizumab. Both of these target interleukin-5 specifically. Then benralizumab hit the market in 2017. This is targeting the IL-5 receptor alpha. And then finally, dupilumab is the latest one on, uh, to, to enter this uh, it's rapidly becoming crowded marketplace. Dupilumab targeting uh, the IL-4 receptor alpha, so slightly different mechanism. Now, similar to the fact that biomarkers predict the frequencies of, of exacerbation, they also, the, gr the greater elevation in your type 2 biomarkers uh, predict a more favorable treatment response to these biologic reagents. Dupilumab is shown here, but this really works for uh, any of the other agents as well. So the higher your peripheral blood eosinophil count, the more favorable uh, your response will be to the drug. And you can see if, if uh, you have less than 150 uh, eosinophils per, uh, to, per millimeter cubed in the peripheral blood, you really didn't have an improved response at all. And so that 150 cells per milli, uh, millimeter or my, uh, uh, in the peripheral blood really is a defining cutoff for type 2 high versus type 2 low asthma. And the greater your type 2 high signature, uh, the greater response you're likely to have to these agents. The same can be said for pheno, which I'm showing on the bottom of this graph here. If you had greater than 50 parts per billion pheno, you had the greatest response in dupilumab. In general, we think about the effects of these drugs that can largely be cl clumped together in terms of the treatment effects. So exacerbations in general with these reagents decrease by about 50%. And you can also, uh, the other primary outcome that, that has really been important is the reduction in oral corticosteroid dose. Uh, some patients, as, uh, as you're likely aware, can completely come off oral steroids. So these are really meaningful outcomes. And th th these drugs have fundamentally changed the way we uh, uh, approach and treat severe asthma. So how do you choose? Uh, ultimately, there's been no head-to-head -head comparison of these drugs. There's been um, some attempts uh, to, to compare different trials of drugs and, and come to outcomes there. That, that I think is pretty fraught um, uh, with uh, you know, error. And so ultimately, it comes down to, in many ways, familiarity with certain agents, as well as insurance coverage and things like that, as well as you know, perhaps some of the subtle differences between each of these drugs. Omalizumab, given the familiarity with that, uh, is uh, favored by some, particularly for allergic asthma, if you have high, uh, you know, elevated IgE and a clear uh, atopic history. It's weight-based. It does carry this anaphylaxis uh, potential, although that's exceedingly rare. But as a result, you know, we have to give it in a clinic, so patients have to come in and, and receive their infusion. It does have some nice long-term data, however. Now, mepolizumab also is starting to develop some long-term data. We have five-year uh, outcomes data and longer now uh, with mepolizumab. Recently, that became available for uh, home administration through a subcutaneous injection. So that, uh, you know, is really a very patient-centered approach. Reslizumab uh, is, remains IV. It is weight-based. And so some of the, you know, if you have a particularly obese patient, a, a weight-based approach may be uh, preferable. But again, because the IV nature of its administration, they have to come into clinic to receive it. 
Uh, Benralizumab uh, is also available for home dosing, similar to mepolizumab. Its dosing after the first three months becomes every other month dosing. And it, in addition, it causes apoptosis of cells that have the IL-5 receptor, so eosinophils and B cells. And as a result, it has this very profound effect at dropping eosinophils. Um, the home administration does make it attractive as well. And then finally, dupilumab. Again, home administration is available. It requires every other week dosing. The, the, the key here is that it's also got an indication for atopic dermatitis. And so this is a really nice agent if somebody has both asthma and atopic dermatitis, you could potentially uh, address both those issues. So given their effects, you know, the, the really positive outcomes with regards to these drugs, where are their unmet needs in eosinophilic asthma? And first and foremost, it's important to note that biologics reduce, but they don't eliminate exacerbations. You know, if you cut exacerbations in half, it still means a lot of patients are having exacerbations. So we clearly don't have it entirely solved. They also have had shown variable efficacy in improving lung function. I mentioned earlier the two primary outcomes are reductions in exacerbations and reductions in oral corticosteroid dosing. Depending on the trial, the effect it has on things like FEV1 can be quite variable. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about why that might be the case. The biomarkers we're currently using certainly are, are uh, not perfect by any means. They, often, they are uh, frequently unable to identify or correctly stratify patients by phenotype. Here's the uh, ROC curves for identification of type 2 high asthma. And you can see pheno and blood eosinophils, while they, uh, well, they're not terrible, they certainly aren't perfect at predicting who has type 2 high asthma. And this is another graphical representation of that. So you can see here on the upper left, these are patients who have high sputum eosinophils, but low blood eosinophils. And the bottom right box is patients with high blood eosinophils and low sputum eosinophils. And so while we use blood eosinophils most frequently as a marker for type 2 high asthma, um, it, you know, there, there is a discordance in many patients between the two. And so these are all patients with type 2 I asthma based on gene signatures in the airways. And yet ultimately, uh, the biomarkers we have are, are, are by no means perfect. And finally, it's important to remember that some patients, and I'm sure if you're uh, dealing uh, with these severe asthmatics in clinic, you, you probably have seen these. They, they're patients who have no response to biologics, despite having what appears to be a type 2 high phenotype. The estimate is that about 20 to 30% of patients fail to respond. And I'm showing you this graph here because this is a, showing that even in patients who are failing to respond clinically to these drugs, they still have a drop in blood eosinophils. And so blood eosinophils, while they're clearly a surrogate marker for what's going on in the airways, the reduction in the peripheral blood doesn't explain entirely what eosinophils are doing in airway tissue. Let's talk about what, a little bit about what mepolizumab does, uh, both in blood and tissue. So here's a graph showing the effects of mepolizumab on blood eosinophils. You can see they virtually drop to zero in the blood after uh, the initiation of the medication. However, in this uh, relatively small study, but it's been, it's been um, uh, also been performed by others who have who've confirmed these results, you can see that before and after you start mepolizumab, the airway tissue eosinophils, so these are bronchoscopic biopsies, the tissue eosinophils fell modestly in, in many of the patients, and, and a good number of patients continue to have a persistence of airway tissue eosinophils that are left you know, to, to continue to exert their effects in the tissues, despite the fact that the blood eosinophils have dropped to virtually zero. And so this really speaks to the fact that eosinophils in the blood and eosinophils in the airways uh, are, are very different actors. They have different surface markers and different effects. And until we really address what's happening in the airway tissue itself, uh, uh, we're, we're not likely to uh, you know, have as great an effect uh, as, as we can possibly achieve. So what are eosinophils doing in the airways? Well, when we talk about asthmatic airway remodeling, we think about things like epithelial injury. We think about subepithelial fibrosis smooth muscle hypertrophy, and mucus hyperplasia. These are some of the classic phenotypic changes in the airways in, in patients with uh, longstanding asthma. Our group is interested in a different structure in the airways, and those are airway nerves. You can see here, I, we've got an, a bundle of airway nerves. This is the, the dark brown or black uh, color in this picture. Um, it, the nerve is cut in cross sections, so you're kind of looking uh, down uh, the nerve itself. And then next to the nerve, you'll notice there's an eosinophil. It's sitting right on the, on the nerve itself. And it turns out that airway nerves actually recruit, actively recruit eosinophils to them. 
Uh, and the, the effect of those ESNFLs uh, have when they're in close proximity to nerves are quite profound on nerve function. So again, here's a cross section of an airway nerve. I've outlined it for you here. And you can see around these ner this nerve, you have a number of ESNFLs. Some are in direct contact. And in fact, one of the ESNFLs has migrated within the perineurum uh, uh, to be uh, in, in proximity to all the nerve axons that are in there as well. This is a slide from a patient who died of fatal asthma. And when you look at patients who died of fatal asthma, they have a disproportionate number of ESNFLs clustered around their nerves. And so there's clearly, this is quite a dynamic process but whereby ESNFLs are migrating into the airways and specifically to airway nerves and exerting a, you know, effects on, ner on nerve function. So what are the role of nerves in airways? Here I'm showing a parasympathetic nerve. It's an autonomic nerve. It runs in the vagus nerve. The preganglionic parasympathetic nerve synapse on postganglionic uh, nerves within the airway. And those postganglionic nerves release acetylcholine. I've represented that here with ACH. That acetylcholine binds to M3 muscarinic receptors on smooth muscle. These uh, muscarinic receptors are the target of teotropium, for example. This acetylcholine binds and causes smooth muscle contraction, and that smooth muscle as it contracts causes bronchoconstriction. The acetylcholine, however, also feeds back on an M2 inhibitory receptor that's on the nerve itself. We don't think about these, uh, this receptor uh, necessarily when you're thinking about asthma, and yet this receptor has a very important role in down-regulating acetylcholine release. It's an auto-inhibitory feedback mechanism. So when acetylcholine binds to M2, it limits its release. However, when eosinophils arrive in the scene, they release proteins, granule proteins, like major basic protein. These are these red proteins you can see uh, on the eosinophil itself there. These bind to M2 and they block its function. And when they do that, they potentiate acetylcholine release. As the acetylcholine release is potentiated, as you can imagine, it leads to excessive bronchoconstriction. And so this is one of the means by which eosinophils affect parasympathetic nerves to worsen bronchoconstriction and asthma. This is uh, work done by a colleague of my, mine here, Dr. Uh, Allison Fryer, who really pioneered this work in the late 80s and, and has really worked out this mechanism quite nicely. We can block this mechanism by, by using antibodies against major basic protein or, or by using natively charged uh, uh, products like heparin. We can also block the effects of eosinophils by blocking their arrival in the airways, either using antibodies against VLA-4, which is a receptor for ICAM, or antibodies against CCR3, it's the eotaxin receptor. More recently, we've been interested in another set of nerves in the airways, and these are sensory nerves. So sensory nerves also travel within the vagus. They send their signals from the airways up to the brain. And as you can see, these nerve endings, they actually are uh, nerve endings that uh, emerge through the airway epithelium, and they're mixed throughout it. And their role there is to detect inhaled irritants. When they detect these irritants, uh, you know, things like smoke, um, uh, viruses, et cetera, uh, they send, these, send signals up the vagus nerve to the brain stem. And in the central nervous system, they actually integrate these signals and can trigger parasynthetic nerves to, uh, to fire. And by doing that, it's called a reflex bronchoconstriction because sensory nerves here are sending signals that activate parasympathetic nerves to release acetylcholine. And so in this way, sensory nerves uh, it, it are able to elicit bronchoconstriction in response to various agents within the airway. So they have an important role. You can stimulate these, uh, this population of nerves experimentally by giving the, the aerosolizing serotonin into the airways. This triggers a reflex bronchoconstriction. It's, it's something we're gonna come back to later when we're testing the effects of, uh, of various agents on sensory nerve function. And so really the focus of our work in the last, in, in, in recent years has been trying to understand the effects of eosinophils on these sensory nerves in the airways. Are they undergoing airway remodeling like we see with other cells within airways? And what are the effects of remodeling on nerve function and ultimately the effects on bronchoconstriction? Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, you were looking at, at a nerve in cross section when you're looking at tissue histology. And th the fact is that classic tissue section histology really does a poor job of characterizing nerve structure. Nerves form these very complex three-dimensional tree-like, you know, tree and branch-like structures in the airways. 
Um, but tissue section histology, as you can see here, I've, I've pointed to airway nerves with these red arrows. When you cut them in cross section, you lose all the details of these nerves. Things like branching, the degree of branching, how many branch points they have, and how long the airway nerves are is, is, is essentially impossible to know from tissue section histology. And so we think that's, you know, that's likely one of the reasons why airway nerves have received so little attention over the years in terms of remodeling an asthma. And we needed to find a better way to study these nerves. And so we turned to a technique called optical clearing. And I'm showing you on the left, this is a fixed mouse lung. Uh, you can, I mean, clearly it's opaque. You can immerse, uh, um, uh, submerge a, a lung like this in a variety of reagents that changes the optical density of the lung. And when, it, when you do that, you basically render this tissue completely transparent, which allows you to then use things like confocal microscopy to look at deep structures in the lungs in three dimensions in their intact state. And so that's what we did. We fix uh, mice, uh, a series of mouse lungs, we optically clear them, and then we label the nerves with immunofluorescent probes, in particular against a protein called PGP 9.5, which is a panderona marker. Okay, I found this one. The, uh, I'm showing you here, this is a represent an image that we generated using this technique. This is, of course, a uh, fully intact uh, mouse respiratory system. Uh, we have labeled the nerves and, and imaged the, the, the lungs in, in their intact state, and we've then artificially uh, rendered airway nerves in yellow to give you a sense of what the airway structures look like. We have also changed the airway nerves, uh, sorry, the pleural nerves to turquoise, and then finally we've labeled nerves in the esophagus and blood vessels in this purple form. You can see this gives you an incredibly detailed and rich understanding of what's happening with these nerve structures in the airways. This is a video, it's uh, giving you a, another sense of how these look in three dimensions. So we're gonna be flying over this mouse lung here. You can see I'm focusing in on both airways as well as some of the pleural nerves. You notice these nerves running right along the airways, essentially creating these silhouettes or casts of the airways themselves. So using this technique, not only does it give us pretty pictures, but it allows us to analyze these nerves in exquisite detail. So if we take a high resolution image from a couple areas in the lung, you can see here on top, I'm showing you a distal airway. Those are nerves wrapping around the airway. And then on the bottom uh, right, uh, I'm showing you a nerve that's around an alveoli. Uh, and then you can see a projection coming off it. Using some uh, software that originally was developed for fingerprint detection, we're able to uh, create models uh, within, the, uh, uh, within an artificial workspace along these nerves. And you can manipulate them in three dimensions now. And by creating these models, it allows us to measure things like nerve length, as well as the number of branch points in these uh, neural systems. I'm showing you branch points here as red dots. We can also apply this to human tissues. And so this is a, uh, uh, using bronchoscopic biopsies, we are actually interested in testing what the effects, uh, what nerve structures look like, sensory nerve structures in particular, in eosinophilic asthma in humans. And so we collaborated with a, a colleague over in Dublin who was doing research biopsies on severe patients with severe persistent asthma, uh, as well as healthy controls. And then we applied our neuromodeling modeling technique. Uh, now I'm showing you, this is a biopsy from a patient with severe asthma. You can see nerves here are labeled in green. They've got branch points as the red dots. And I've also labeled uh, substance P, which is a neuropeptide, is a protein that sensory nerves release. You'll notice that not all sensory nerves express these sorts of peptides, uh, but some do quite intensely. We're zooming in here on that substance P positive nerve. As we zoom back out, we're gonna rotate and you begin to really see the complex nature of these neural networks. In this image, the airway lumen is down. Let's see if I can play that one more time. And I should mention as well, the blue here is airway epithelium. You can see these cuboidal cells that are the airway epithelial layer. Uh, 
So when we applied this technique to these uh, patients with asthma as well as these uh, healthy control patients, we uh, found that uh, nerve length overall in asthmatics was nearly double that of controls. We also found that they had near uh, over a doubling in their branch points. And so not only were nerves becoming quite a bit more dense in terms of uh, nerve length, but they were also becoming more complex. And within individual patients, each, each of these dots represents an individual patient uh, with severe asthma. You can see that the, the increase in nerve length uh, coincided with an increase in branching. And so picture these uh, tree-like networks of nerves that are getting longer and creating more branches up into the airway epithelium. Interestingly, in our, the population we were studying, if patients had uh, elevated peripheral blood eosinophils, so if their peripheral blood eosinophils are over 300 cells per microliter, these were the patients that had the greatest uh, increase in nerve density. So I'm showing you branch points here, but a similar effect was seen with nerve length. When you compared that to what was happening to patients with less than 150 cells or even uh, healthy controls, you see this really stepwise increase in terms of the degree of eosinophilia and the uh, amount of uh, the increase in nerve density, suggesting, although it's just an association, suggesting that there's a relationship between eosinophils and these structural effects that we're seeing on, on airway nerves. I mentioned neuropeptides earlier. I'm not gonna talk too much about neuropeptides today other than to note that in asthma, um, we also saw an increase in the number of sensory nerves expressing substance P. And so, we, you know, this really suggests to us that not only are nerves growing longer and they're becoming more complex, but eosinophils, or at least in asthma, certain signals in asthma are changing the expression profiles of these sensory nerves. Now, because these are just associations in human tissues, we wanted to pin down the role of eosinophils. And so we turned to transgenic mouse models uh, that we maintain in my lab. These are IL-5 transgenic mice. They have IL-5 expressed from a CC10 promoter in the airways. This uh, uh, recruits uh, a, a dense in eosinophilic inflammation in the airways themselves. We also compared it to a mouse that doesn't have any eosinophils. This is known as a fill mouse. They're congenitively, they're, they're phenotypically normal other than that they lack eosinophils from birth. And then finally, we can cross these two mice to generate a mouse that has high levels of airway IL-5 without having any eosinophils. And this mouse is very important for defining what the role of IL-5 is independent from the role of eosinophils. When we looked at nerve characteristics in the airways of these mice, we found similar to humans that in the presence of high IL-5 and uh, increased eosinophils, they had a near doubling in nerve length uh, in the airways. A similar effect was seen with branch points. So I, the, in the presence of eosinophils and IL-5, airway nerves were growing and becoming much more complex. In contrast, the eosinophil deficient mice had very similar nerve lengths to wild type mice. And then finally, they've crossed mice, the high IL-5 uh, mice that lack eosinophils. They, uh, they had very similar nerve characteristics to wild type as well. So this really tells us that eosinophils specifically appear to be mediators in the airway of nerve remodeling. Now, what are the effects of this nerve remodeling? Uh, we, uh, using these same uh, mouse models, we can test airway responses by placing them on a ventilator and we can measure airway resistance in response to inhaled serotonin. And so this way we're triggering reflex bronchoconstriction and then we can measure uh, airway pressures and to calculate airway resistance from that. So that's exactly what we did. We took these mice uh, in which, uh, uh, these, these various mouse models. We gave them aerosolized serotonin. You can see in wild type mice, they have a very modest response to inhaled serotonin. So at baseline, uh, these mice uh, have very minimal response. However, in the presence of increased sensory nerves and increased eosinophils, you have a really dramatic increase in area resistance in response to inhaled serotonin. When we looked at this in comparison to our eosinophil deficient mice, they had similar responses to wild type. And then finally, our IL-5 transgenic mice that lacked eosinophils, they also had airway resistance in response to serotonin that was very similar to wild type. And so this really suggests to us that reflex bronchoconstriction is increased in the setting of eosinophils and is likely the result of increased sensory nerve density in the airways.
But of course, we needed to specifically determine whether this was a reflex response or whether this was just a product of airway smooth muscle being hyper responsive in the setting of eosinophils. And so we can actually block reflex bronchoconstriction by mechanically ligating the vagus nerve in these mice. And after we do that, you entirely lose the reflex response. So we repeated our dose response curves. Here I'm just showing you this is the pre vagotomy. Uh, 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 IL-5 transgenic mouse, and you, the data I was just showing you, you can see their increased response. And after you vagotomize them, the next dose response curve is reflective of the area that represents a nerve reflex. And you can see after vagotomy, they had a dramatic decrease in the uh, response to aerosolized serotonin, telling us that this increased nerve density is really leading to increased reflex problem constriction. So what I've shown you so far is that eosinophils increase sensory nerve density in asthma. And that occurs in humans with eosinophilic asthma, as well as in mouse models of asthma in which animals have high airway eosinophils. This appears to be, IL not a, this appears to be eosinophil specific and not a product of just elevated IL-5 in the airways. And this nerve remodeling increases nerve media bronchoconstriction, reflex bronchoconstriction, uh, which uh, likely contributes to uh, excessive bronchoconstriction in human asthma. I also mentioned briefly the increase in substance P suggests that these aren't just changes in nerve structure that are occurring, it's changes in nerve expression as well. And so the, the cumulative effects of these are quite profound in terms of the way airway nerves are regulating bronchoconstriction and asthma. So where are we going with some of this work? Some of the, this is a, one of the recently generated images uh, uh, looking at airway nerves and their relationship to eosinophils. I mentioned earlier that eosinophils, uh, particularly their close proximity to airway nerves, tends to be very important for their effects on airway nerves. And so now we're trying to understand what the effects, uh, uh, what the spatial relationships are between eosinophils and nerves. Here's a raw image. You can see PGP 9.5, this nerve protein is labeled in green and eosinophils here are in pink. We're gonna apply our modeling over these airway nerves. And then we're gonna apply a mask around the eosinophils. And as we take away the, uh, uh, the, the raw intensity pixelation, you begin to see this relationship between these uh, dense neural networks and eosinophils. I've labeled eosinophils that are in close proximity to nerves, meaning within a cell body width of a nerve here using these orange boxes. And then three eosinophils have turned purple, those ones that are in physical contact with the nerves themselves. Again, this is a patient with severe asthma and this is a bronchoscopic human biopsy from that patient. Let's see if I can play that one more time. These sort of images really give you the sense of, of how inadequate classic you know, tissue section histology is and understanding the relationships between these sorts of cells and these really complicated neural networks in the airways. In the airway epithelium here, it's almost entirely sensory nerves. Uh, it, it, so in, in this population, we're really focusing on a very specific subset of nerves. And this gives you the full thickness of the airway epithelium. You can see those nerves reaching up through the epithelium So some of the questions we're asking using this, uh, this technology is how are biologics affecting nerve and eosinophil interactions? And so part of the study that we have ongoing right now, I don't have results for you today, but we want to understand before somebody starts a biologic to, to, to after they've been on it for, for you know, four to six months, are there effects on the way eosinophils in the tissue are interacting with the nerves? And, and potentially are, are those uh, effects going to impact uh, airway function. 
this is shifting gears a little bit, but one of the other questions we really want to ask is, uh, and, and we haven't totally pinned down, but we're curious about whether nerve remodeling is a cause of asthma or a consequence. Does somebody develop airway nerve remodeling early in life, and that is essentially primes their system the development of asthma later on, or do airway nerves after asthma begins to develop start to change their structure and function? So in essence, is it a cause of asthma or is it a consequence? Our previous human data that I've been showing you, these studies are all cross-sectional in nature, and so it's very hard to, to pin down exactly when nerve remodeling occurs. However, there's plenty of epidemiologic evidence in humans that suggests that changes in nerves may actually be occurring all the way back in utero. And we refer to these effects in utero as prenatal programming. Some of the data that support a link between prenatal programming uh, as a risk factor for development of asthma is that for one, parental asthma is a risk factor for asthma in children. However, maternal asthma confers a greater risk of asthma in the offspring than paternal asthma. So it suggests that there's more than just a shared environment after birth that contributes to asthma risk. We also know that better asthma control during pregnancy decreases asthma risk in children, suggesting that this is a modifiable environment for a fetus in utero. And then finally, we can detect airway hyperreactivity at birth, suggesting that there are events before a, a, a newborn sees their environment that are affecting the way their airways are functioning. So cumulatively, these data suggest there's a component of prenatal programming, which likely is, uh, involves ex utero exposures, which shape uh, somebody's asthma risk, particularly early in life. Now, we wanted to test this, and it's a very hard thing to test in humans, as you can imagine, but we have this, uh, we, we again turned to our mouse models and we created a breeding scheme whereby if you mate an IL-5 transgenic mother with a wild type father, they're gonna, they have a certain number of wild type offspring. And these wild type offspring are exposed to high levels of IL-5, if they've got, uh, these mothers had high circulating IL-5 levels. The offspring are wild type phenotypically, but in utero, they, they had high levels of IL-5 exposure. And so this will tell us what the, <clears throat> excuse me, what some of the effects of IL-5 are on fetal development. And furthermore, we wanted to take it a step further and understand not just what their effects were at baseline of this IL-5 exposure, but how it affected subsequent responses to allergen like house dust mite, which I've indicated here with HDM. So when we created this model, here we're looking at airway function just in this, sec this F1 generation, the, the offspring of this uh, IL-5 transgenic mother. All of these mice are wild type. The square boxes that are red, they, uh, they had high IL-5 exposure in utero. And when they were in, reached adult, we exposed them to vehicle. So they're wild type mice, vehicle exposed. And the only difference is they had IL-5 IL in utero. And you can see at baseline, it didn't affect their airway responses. They had very similar airway responses to the circles, which are wild type mice born to wild type mice, also exposed to vehicle in adulthood. So at baseline, IL-5 didn't appear to be affecting airway responses. This group here is a wild type mouse born to a wild type uh, mother. They were exposed to house dust mite. And as you'd expect, you see an increase in airway resistance telling us that the, uh, these are uh, uh, mice who have become allergen sensitized. And this of course is one of the classic models, uh, mouse models for, for eosinophilic, eosinophilic airway inflammation. When we tested the same effects, however, in uh, wild type mice exposed to high IL-5 in utero, we saw that they had a potentiation of the responses to house dust mite. In fact, these uh, mice, uh, this, these are the, the dark red boxes now, their responses to serotonin were so severe that they couldn't complete a dose response curve without having fatal bronchoconstriction. And so this really tells us that while IL-5 did not appear to be doing anything to the baseline uh, function uh, of the airways, it certainly altered your, their subsequent response to allergen in later life to the point that there was fatal in all mice. Now we wanted to confirm that these mice were truly seeing high levels of IL-5 and 
The system seemed to be frozen to anybody other than me. It's frozen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's frozen. Hello? Yes, it's frozen. All right. Not working I have no idea what to do in that situation. It's probably his connection. So we just have to wait for his Zoom to reboot. Okay. He he doesn't know he's frozen, I suspect. Probably by now he will. Do you have his phone number? You could just uh, send him a text. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, Sonia, are you listening? We just found his number and text him, so we'll see if that happens, if it helps. Okay, who said that? Um, this is Gina with Glaxo. He's back. Oh, oh he, it looks like he's back. At least the screen's back. I don't have any audio, but. Any idea where I froze up? Um, Did you guys see this slide? No, there, that's where you were. Right here, okay. So, um, sorry about that. Uh, wouldn't be a Zoom call without a little minor technical difficulty. So uh, let me just start from, from the top here briefly. So I was talking about testing the role of prenatal programming and development of asthma. And we use this mouse model uh, where we uh, generate wild type mice from a union of IL-5 transgenic mothers. So there's high circulating levels of IL-5 in this mouse. And uh, the, the, parent, the father is a, a phenotypic wild type. And the wild type offspring that they have from these mice are exposed to high IL-5 in utero, uh, but they uh, are, are wild type geno, uh, a wild type genotype. Now we wanted to study the effects at baseline on, uh, of, these, uh, of IL-5 exposure on these mice, but we also wanted to know whether the exposure to IL-5 in utero altered your subsequent response to house dust mite. And so when we tested airway function in these mice, here I'm showing you uh, 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 two groups of mice. The, the red boxes are uh, mice that are wild type. They were exposed to high IL-5 in Euro. And then when they reached adulthood, they received a vehicle treatment. And you can see at baseline, just ex being exposed to IL-5 in Euro didn't dramatically change your air responses to aer aerosolized serotonin as compared to a wild type mouse that had a wild type mother. And when we took a wild type mouse that had a wild type mother and gave them house dust mite, as you'd expect, you saw an increase in airway resistance in response to serotonin. So these are allergen sensitized mice and it's a, it's a very classic model for, for testing airway function in the setting of eosinophilia. However, when we looked at the mice that had IL-5 exposure in utero, these are wild type mice with IL-5 exposure in utero, who then subsequently got house dust mite they had a dramatic increase in their bronchoconstriction to the point that it was so severe that they were suffering from fatal bronchoconstriction about midway through their dose response curve. So this tells us that IL-5 exposure in utero, while it doesn't appear to be affecting the baseline function of, 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 uh, of the airways, it certainly was altering subsequent effects to allergen, essentially priming the system for potentiated responses to allergen later in life. Now we wanted to confirm that these mice were uh, actually seeing IL-5 and so the wild type of offspring were tested, uh, the amniotic fluid was tested for IL-5. You can see at, at baseline, uh, a wild type mouse doesn't have much IL-5 in their amniotic fluid. These uh, offspring of the IL-5 transgenic mothers were, had quite a high degree of IL-5 in their amniotic fluid. And uh, as a result of that, the fetuses that were developing had high levels of eosinophilia. And so the maternal IL-5 was certainly inducing eosinophilia in the offspring. 
Now, again, the question of whether this is IL-5 or if this is eosinophils, we were uh, uh, changed our model slightly here. We're using IL-5 transgenic mothers and we're pairing them with an eosinophil deficient father. And then we look at the eosinophil deficient offspring of these mice. So these mice have high IL-5 exposure in utero, but grow up with, uh, you know, into adulthood without any eosinophils in the blood or in the lungs. And then subsequently, again, we expose them to house dust mite or vehicle in, in, in adulthood. And when we performed the airway resistance measurements in these mice, we saw that uh, the exposure, this is the box that I've, I've circled here in red, these are the eosinophil deficient mice that were exposed to high IL-5 in utero and then subsequently received house dust mite. They had no increase in their airway responses to, to house dust mite. So really suggesting to us that it's eosinophils that are specific mediators of these effects, this potentiation of response to house dust mite. The other groups I'm showing you here, here's our, uh, is a wild type mouse with house dust mite exposure at the top. And then the two other control groups down below, a wild type, uh, uh, sorry, eosinophil deficient mouse born to wild type mothers, uh, either exposed to house dust mite or to vehicle. Now our associations with eosinophils and airway nerves led us to look at uh, uh, nerve density in the airways of these mice. Again, these are the wild type offspring of wild type mothers and the vehicle versus house dust mite is the exposure they received in adulthood. And as expected, the, the acute house dust mite treatment in adulthood did not affect nerve length in these airways. However, when you looked at the mice that were uh, exposed to IL-5 in utero, they, uh, uh, these are wild type mice, high IL-5 in utero, you saw they, also, they had a significant increase in their nerve length. So they have more dense nerves as a result of exposure to maternal IL-5. When we wanted to test, similar to our previous experiments, we wanted to test the role of reflex bronchoconstriction in these mice. And so we performed vagotomy in a series of these mice. And you can see that vagotomy, uh, these are the open, uh, the, the, the pink uh, squares. This uh, vagotomy essentially rescued the airway responses in these mice. So if you vagotomize a mouse, that uh, is exposed to high IL-5 in utero and then gets house dust mite in adulthood, they now were able to survive their dose response curve. And, and, and so it really tells us that the difference between these two curves is the reflection of the reflex bronchoconstriction uh, that, that they're seeing. Now, when we looked at the eosinophil deficient offspring of, of both these models, so these are the, uh, the, the, the eosinophil deficient offspring that received house dust mite in adulthood, when they were born to wild type mothers or whether they were born to IL-5 transgenic mothers, they had very similar nerve structures in the airways to wild type offspring of wild type mothers. And so the model that we've really set up here is one that maternal IL-5 crosses the placenta affects fetal eosinophilia, increases circulating and lung eosinophils in the developing fetus, which has really profound impact on the way nerves are growing in the developing, uh, in the developing offspring. You see an increase in nerve length, nerve density, as well as a potentiation of this nerve reflex mediated bronchoconstriction in mice. The fact that in humans you can target, uh, you can improve uh, asthma risk in offspring by, by uh, targeting uh, uh, better asthma control, it suggests that this is a modifiable uh, opportunity in humans as well. So with just a few minutes left, let me summarize what we've covered today. First and foremost, I've shown you the eosinophils increase sensory nerve density in mice and in humans with eosinophilic asthma. These eosinophil nerve interactions, they potentiate bronchoconstriction, and they do that through uh, a number of different means, uh, uh, but principally by altering both the structure and function of sensory nerves, as well as the uh, functional output of parasympathetic nerves. Fetal programming in utero fundamentally alters the way airway nerves develop, and it certainly impacts future responses to allergens. So it's not just nerve growth alone that seems to be uh, the, the risk factor for developing airway hyperresponsiveness. It's the presence of increased nerves that alters your subsequent responses to allergen as well. So these are a very uh, interesting interplay that we're starting to look at further into. And as I mentioned, these neuroeosinophil interactions, they offer a number of therapeutic targets, uh, whether it's in the developing feeders or even in, in uh, patients who have uh, the presence of uh, uh, airway hyperinnervation and eosinophilia uh, is, is a rich uh, uh, framework for developing targets uh, therapeutically to address, uh, address this mechanism.
Uh, before I finish up, I just want to make sure I acknowledge uh, our fantastic group of collaborators here, uh, a number of members of our lab currently, as well as former members, and then our collaborators, uh, uh, both uh, Rich Kostler, who uh, uh, and Dominic Shaw, who helped to obtain a number of the airway biopsies, uh, and Jamie Lee, uh, who was uh, based out of the Mayo um, and sadly passed away a few years ago, was uh, instrumental in developing a number of these uh, transgenic mouse models. And then finally, everyone, thank you for tuning in. I very much appreciate it. I'm told that I need to indicate that the word of the day is eosinophilic. Uh, and as always, I hope everyone's staying uh, safe and happy and healthy out there. And I'll definitely take any questions. I, I, uh, please unmute your mics and, and go ahead and ask any questions if you have them. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. That was uh, brilliant. And uh, the imaging is amazing. Um, I, this is Len Altman. I have a question. Do you know what substance or biologic mediator eosinophils, um, which of its toxic granule components, if any, is the cause of the interaction with nerves? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a great question. I we we don't we haven't uh, we're looking into it. Uh, we think uh, our you know our leading candidate is eosinophil peroxidase. It it. Uh, uh, oxidizes a variety of things, and it, it has a pretty profound effect on airway, uh, a variety of airway nerve structures. And so we think eosinophil peroxidase may be one of the main mediators. But you know, the, the question as well is uh, uh, whether there are, uh, what the other cells in this environment are doing, and in particular, because we're seeing increased nerve growth in airway epithelium, uh, we, we are really interested in what uh, uh, substances the epithelium is releasing. And so it's possible that some of this that uh, nerve growth is a product of things like nerve growth factor or other neurotrophins that the airway epithelium is, is producing in the setting of eosinophilic inflammation uh, and, and uh, airway remodeling. But yeah, that's a great question. It's one we're, we're intensely interested in. Well, think, since you think it's a peroxidase, what about neutrophilic asthma? Neutrophils are very rich in myeloperoxidase. Right. Do you have any studies um, in yeah. neutrophilic we asthma? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We, uh, in the, the study, the human study that we uh, uh, published last year, um, uh, the, the folks who had type 2 low asthma, which, which likely, in, you know, uh, in, involved a number of neutrophilic asthmatics, tended not to have as, uh, it, it tended not to have increased nerve density in, in comparison to healthy controls. That being said, um, you know, our study wasn't specifically, it, what, we really didn't phenotype the neutrophilic asthma in the same way that we were phenotyping uh, type 2 high asthmatics. And so I, I'm, I'm cautious in over-interpreting uh, either the lack or presence of, of changes in nerve remodeling in the setting of neutrophilic asthma. But I think it's an excellent point. It, eosinophil peroxidase is a, a, a quite a bit greater peroxidase activity than myeloperoxidase, but nonetheless, I mean, it's certainly a possibility. The other thing that uh, we're working on, uh, actually, it's, it's under review right now. We, we did apply the same technique to patients with chronic cough. Uh, chronic cough uh, is, uh, is really triggered by airway sensory nerves. And so we wanted to ask similar questions about what was happening to nerve structure and expression in chronic cough. And we found that in cough patients, similar to severe asthma, they had a, a, a much increased nerve density, suggesting that these changes in nerve structures uh, in those patients were, were one of the ways, uh, one of the means by which chronic cough develops and persists. Now, those patients with chronic cough did not have a lot of airway eosinophils. And so it's possible that airway nerve remodeling is the product, uh, you know, can develop through a number of different mechanisms, eosinophils being one of them. Uh, but, but also in the setting of airway irritation and other diseases, you can develop nerve remodeling. So uh, yeah, it, I think it's an excellent question. It's something we're looking into in a variety of airway diseases and, and you know, whether it's cough or it's bronchoconstriction, there's a variety of symptoms that can develop uh, as a result of uh, you know, maladaptive nerve function. I had one other question. It, does IL-5 have any functions if you have no eosinophils? Yeah, I mean, that was a question we wanted to, that's in particular why we used our eosinophil deficient mice that had high IL-5. Um, because other inflammatory cells express, uh, you know, IL-5 receptor B cells. Uh, there's even a study showing in certain settings, macrophages can express IL-5. Um, and so, 
there, there are potentially a variety of effects of IL-5 that could be independent of eosinophils. Now, we didn't see that in our studies. It, it looked like IL-5 specifically was mediating, it, mediating its effect uh, through airway eosinophils. Anyone else with questions this morning? All right, if I don't have any other questions, I really appreciate everyone tuning in. I uh, hope, uh, hope the days are going well for you all and hopefully one of these days we can have an in-person meeting. It uh, would be a wild concept. I'm really looking for just about any reason to put on a tie these days. So <laughs> hopefully we Actually, can- Actually, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, you talked about uh, how dust mite allergen exposure in uh, in the young in combination with the with the IL five, does that is there any implications in terms of doing house dust mite avoidance measures in infancy? Yeah, I mean that's a you, you, it's a great question and it's a really complex question because um, uh, you know obviously in in the human environment there are a variety of different allergens beyond house dust mite. Uh, that patients can, can become sensitized to. Um, the, uh, th there's certainly a recommendations for house dust mite avoidance uh, in, in pa pa uh, patients with allergic asthma and things like that. Um, it, it, but uh, whether, what the effects are of, of, first off, whether you'd be f really able to eliminate house dust mite exposure and whether that would be sufficient in somebody who's got a primed immune response uh, to various allergens, whether that would be sufficient to uh, uh, alter patient's trajectory, I think is unclear. But our, our data certainly suggests that that uh, it, that you know limiting exposure to allergens in the immediate environment, uh, in the in the in the postnatal environment, uh, could be a, a, a really potential uh, opportunity uh, to prevent these this uh, these harmful interactions between nerves and eosinophils. I mean, in contrast, early dog and cat exposure tends to decrease the later sensitivity. Right. house dust might, it seems like it would be, uh, that might not be true. It, it, I mean, you're certainly right. It, and it, to be fair, you know, I mean, we're, these are, our, uh, our mouse models are not, um, uh, you, you know, not 100% reflective of, of what we might be seeing in humans as well. And so the question of whether, you know, what the, what is the balance between developing tolerance for, versus potentiating, uh, you know, a, a, a response like that? Uh, it's, it's one that, I mean, I think we've, we've been talking about it as a field for, you know, 50 years, whether you should be avoiding allergens or whether you should be exposing yourself in limited, limited fashion and, uh, you know, to, to develop that tolerance. So it's an excellent question. Uh, it's certainly the jury's out in that respect. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Hi, this is Paul McBride. I am just wondering if you're using more anticholinergics in your routine asthma therapy now. Yeah, I, I, I certainly tend to, to um, you know, with our interest in nerves and whatnot, teotropium blocks reflex responses. And, and um, I think that because anticholinergics really were kind of um, a, ignored maybe too strong a word, but they really didn't enter the algorithm for treating asthma uh, until, uh, you know, really relatively recently as compared to the LABAs and the inhaled corticosteroids. Um, and so as of right now, we tend to use teotropium in patients who have pretty, you know, relatively severe disease. Uh, and in those patients, um, oftentimes, uh, you know, the effect of teotropium in the setting of very severe disease is a little bit more modest. I, I think it's, it's an excellent opportunity to block reflex bronchoconstriction. Um, and I certainly, uh, I, I mean, I certainly use plenty of teotropium, particularly for patients who have in, inadequate control, um, you know, with just inhaled steroids and lavas alone and things like that. It, it, from a mechanistic standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. And I think the real question is, is, is nerve remodeling, you know, not only are there therapeutic targets there, but is this actually, a subphenotype of patients with type 2 high asthma. Uh, and if we can identify them, are they going to have a more favorable response to teotropium uh, or other, other uh, reagents that are going to block nerve and eosinophil interactions? You know, the, the GINA guidelines are so, uh, really just this umbrella that we clump all our asthmatics into. But 
uh, you know, going forward as we as we get better and better at defining mechanisms that underlie specific, uh, you know, an individual patient's asthma, there's certainly uh, it's, it's a strong possibility there's a subset of patients out there that are going to have a really nice response to teotropram, uh, in, likely in conjunction with some other agent that's uh, reducing eosinophils. Do you know of any literature where they're using vagotomy and super selective vagotomies in humans? Yeah, I mean, so they looked at vagotomy. There was a number of trials that looked at um, vagotomy in COPD. Uh, the trouble is that uh, COPD really is a very different airway disease from asthma. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the increase in smooth muscle mass and and, and uh, hyper responsiveness that you get, uh, particularly nerve media hyper responsiveness that you get in asthma is not necessarily a feature of COPD. So those early trials that, that were doing vagotomy, I really think we're kind of missing the point. They weren't targeting the right population. More recently, there's been um, an interest in bronchial thermoplasty and its role in, uh, in, in asthmatics uh, and particularly the effects of bronchial thermoplasty on airway nerves. There's a couple studies out there that used um, that you know use section tissue section histology, and it, the suggestion was that not only does bronchial thermoplasty reduce uh, smooth muscle mass, but it also decreases nerve density in those airways. I think that, that some of that data is, is still needs to be validated uh, and confirmed, um, but that's one means by which you know you could, it, while it's not truly a vagotomy, you're you're you'd be affecting nerve density in the airways, it potentially could have an effect there. The other one is, um, is some preclinical uh, 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 group that's uh, developing a, a, it's a radio frequency ablation of, uh, uh, of airway nerves and particularly parasympathetic ganglia. Um, so similar to the brachiothermoplasty probe, they apply this probe to the airway walls, this radio frequency ablates uh, neural structures deeper in the airways. Um, and the, and it's, in essence, you're performing a, a selective vagotomy in those patients using this technique. And neither, you know, there's still a lot of questions about the role of bronchial thermoplasty. And I think this, this radio frequency ablation is, while it's a very interesting concept, there's a lot we need to work out in. But there, there are potentially ways we could do airway vagotomies uh, uh, without affecting, uh, you know, the global uh, vagal, uh, the, ro the global role of the vagus nerve. It obviously innervates a lot of your visceral organs. And so just performing a a vagotomy uh, and, and hoping for the best is, uh, is, a, is a pretty drastic measure, but certainly some exciting kind of nerve ablative techniques that are, that are on the horizon. No, it reminds me, I mean, didn't surgeons years ago to treat peptic ulcer disease just do uh, crude vagotomies? Right. Anybody right. ever look at what effect that had on pulmonary disease at the same time? You know, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure where they're performing the vagotomy. You have to do a fairly high up vagotomy to affect, um, you know, innervation of, uh, you know, the airway innervation. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure where they were doing those vagotomies. I'd have to go look, but uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if anybody else does on the chat. Yeah, the, the different era of medicine then. <laughs> All right, any remaining questions? Otherwise, uh, thank you. Very much. This reminds me, I don't know how many years ago, Allison Fryer yeah. spoke to the, our group. Um, is she still active with the group? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's, uh, her office is just down the hall. Uh, and uh, she, uh, yeah, she's part of our group. We have, uh, uh, you know, several uh, uh, collaborators down here, all looking at different portions of, of airway innervation uh, in, in a variety of different models, uh, asthma being one of them, uh, our kind of prenatal developmental models. We, we have uh, uh, groups that are looking at the effects of ozone and the interactions between ozone and inflammatory cells and nerve, nerves in the airways uh, and things like that. And so Allison, Allison remains a major part of our group. She also runs the graduate studies program down here. So she's been a little bit tied up uh, recently trying to transition an entire uh, program into the virtual space, so. All right, well, thank you. A very enjoyable, very educational presentation. Much appreciated. Of course. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.